Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on the design and management of organic strawberry vegetable rotation by Carol Shannon and Joji Morimoto of the University of California at Santa Cruz. This is your host, Alice Formiga, from the eOrganic Community of Practice at eExtension. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and our many upcoming and archived webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org in the Organic Agriculture section. Before we start, I'd like to give you a very quick rundown of today's program. The presentation will last about 45 minutes. We'll be reading the questions out loud after the presentation is over, at which time we'll have about 30 minutes for your questions. So today, we're very pleased to welcome back Carol Shannon and Joji Muramoto. Um, they and other members of their research group have presented several um, webinars um, with the organic on topics such as anaerobic soil disinfestation, as well as strawberry pest and fertility management, which are available in our archive. So Carol is actually going to be presenting today, and Joji is going to be online during the question and answer period, um, and he'll chime in um, to help answer the questions. So um, Carol Shannon is an agroecologist in the Department of Environmental Studies at UCSC. She's been working on management of organic cropping systems for many years with an emphasis on cover crops, nutrient management, and soil-borne disease management. She's also the project director of CalCOR, the California Collaborative Organic Research and Extension Network, which is a consortium of researchers, farmers, extension, and other organizations dedicated to organic agriculture research. Joji Muramoto is an associate researcher researcher at the, in the Department of Environmental Studies, also at UCSC. He is a soil scientist and agroecologist specializing in fertility and soil-borne disease management in organic strawberries and vegetables in um, central coastal California. So with that, I'm going to hand over the PowerPoint slides to Carol Shannon. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Alice, and welcome everybody to the webinar. Um, and as Alice said, I'll be talking about our work primarily through the CalCore project, um, but drawing on some other areas as well, um, to discuss issues around designing strawberry vegetable rotations. And uh, Alice mentioned CalCore, and this is a group that um, we originally formed over 10 years ago, um, and we've been working together um, to do various aspects of organic agriculture research over the past 10 years. And about five years ago, we got together and decided that we had done a lot of work on different aspects of um, production, fertility management or disease management or pest management, but we hadn't really tried to put it all together um, into integrated rotation systems. And so that was really the focus of uh, the CalCore project that was funded by the OREI program in 2011. Just to give you an idea of who the network is, um, this slide sh shows everybody I think who's involved. There may still be more that I'm, I'm missing. Um, and it's a mix of, along the top you can see researchers, you see extension, um, researchers from other institutions, as well as some nonprofits like um, CCOF, uh, the Community Alliance of Family Farms, and industry people, uh, Company Farm Fuel Incorporated, and um, the California Strawberry Commission. And then a big part of the network are our farmers um, who are collaborating on the research in, in a variety of ways, as you'll see. And they're all listed below. So when we're thinking about designing rotations, um, I thought it would be worth going over some of the issues that we wanted to address. Um, disease management are obviously key, and rotation is you know, one of the main uh, strategies that organic farmers have to combat um, disease and pest problems. Fertility management is obviously another important element. And to try and develop rotations that give farmers some flexibility in the crop choices they can make. And as you'll see with strawberry systems, that's a challenge um, that we specifically wanted to look at. Um, but given varying 
market conditions um, and other considerations, it's good for farmers to have a wide range of crops that they could choose from, ideally. And finally, we'll also consider briefly soil quality and organic matter management. So mostly we'll be talking about data from um, the mother baby trials that are part of the CalCor project, um, which I will explain in a moment. And then there are some other um, studies we've done on fields elsewhere in coastal California that are relevant for discussion of the disease and pest management options. So the, the background for strawberry and vegetable production in, in coastal California is that the strawberry crop is by far the major source of revenue from the rotation. So there's interest in being able to grow strawberries um, fairly often. Uh, many organic farmers go five years between strawberry crops, which can be challenging economically. Um, and so there's interest in whether by building in some other particularly disease management pro uh, approaches, we might be able to shorten that rotation or not, um, but to get an idea of what's possible. Uh, organic strawberry production uh, is limited, uh, we think, by soil-borne diseases and nitrogen availability. So typically organic uh, strawberry yields are about 60% of conventional yields. Although in some of our trials, we've been able to get yields um, comparing the compare favorably with conventional um, production with some of our treatments. The major disease historically has been verticillium wilt caused by verticillium dallii. Um, but re in recent years, fusarium wilt and charcoal rot are also emerging problems that um, we need to deal with. Now, unfortunately, most vegetable crops are hosts for the same verticillium wilt that attacks the strawberries, which makes it challenge to, challenging to design good rotations that don't allow for the buildup of verticillium in the soil. Um, broccoli, at least some varieties of it, seem to be a, a good, it, well, they're all a non-host, and some varieties may even suppress verticillium wilt. Um, so uh, it's a recommended practice to grow broccoli before you grow strawberries. Um, but broccoli has a lower value than uh, other crops like lettuce, and there's also a limited market for organic strawberries, um, which makes it challenging for um, st strawberry producers to always grow broccoli uh, prior to the strawberry crop. So given those considerations, we wanted to ask how do crop choices, rotation length, and various disease fertility management strategies compare in terms of how productive the system is, uh, the type of nutrient cycling that occurs, and if we get significant losses, particularly of, of nitrogen through leaching or denitrification. Um, in terms of disease incidence, do we build up disease during the rotation or are we able to control it? Soil carbon dynamics and of course the uh, comparative economics of the different systems. Now I won't be talking about the economics today because the, that is still being worked on. We've just finished the fourth year of the uh, four-year cycle and so the economics are now um, just being calculated. So that gave us the, the ideas, and then we had to turn that into specific treatments. Um, and so as a group, we decided on the following. We wanted to compare two-year versus four-year rotations. Um, some growers would like to go to a two-year rotation, but we're very concerned about that in terms of disease management in particular. And so we're looking to compare two different two-year rotations and two four-year rotations. Either one that we think will suppress disease by planting broccoli in between the strawberry crops or, or before the strawberry crops, um, or what may be more economically attractive, growing lettuce before strawberries. Then within the, each of these rotations, we wanted to test two different approaches to disease management. The first one being anaerobic soil disinfestation, or ASD as I'll refer to it, um, you, prior to strawberry planting. 
Now, for those of you who don't know what ASD is, um, I recommend you check out the webinar that we did in 2014 with eOrganic, which will give you a lot of background on the technique. But briefly, it involves adding a carbon source to the soil and then uh, through and covering the beds with a tarp and then irrigating to uh, just above field capacity to stimulate breakdown of the carbon that's been added through uh, anaerobic respiration pathways. Um, and the, it's products of these pathways and the microbial changes that occur are together thought to provide the disease control. And ASD has been shown to be effective against quite a number of diseases. And our previous work suggested that it's effective against verticillium, uh, wilt in particular. The second treatment is a mustard seed meal amendment, uh, where again there's evidence from uh, work with apples that mustard seed meal can control a variety of soil-borne pathogens. We also wanted to consider uh, how we would manage fertility uh, in each of the rotations, and the possibilities we were looking at were using winter cover crops uh, as the sole source of fertility input, um, and that would be a cereal legume mix cover crop. A winter cover crop treatment with additional composts and the potential for adding supplemental fertility inputs. And then the mustard seed meal um, would be applied in conjunction with a winter cover crop that this would just be a cereal um, because the mustard seed meal is very high in nitrogen. So we ended up with 16 treatments in what's called the mother trial, which is the main replicated field trial that we have on the farm here at UC Santa Cruz. And you can see that the main plots were either two versus four year rotations. And then within each of those, we had the lettuce based rotation or the broccoli based rotation with the expectation that um, the broccoli would be uh, based rotations would be more disease suppressive um, than the lettuce. But then within each of these um, four rotation types, we then split the plots uh, according to the particular um, fertility and disease management strategies. So the first one was the legume cereal winter cover crop between the vegetable crops and then ASD um, using rice bran as a carbon source um, for uh, prior to the strawberry crop. Then there's a legume cereal cover crop with additional compost and feather meal if needed, um, uh, and then the use of ASD before the strawberry crop. Um, there was the mustard seed meal with the uh, winter cover crop, the cereal. Um, and then we did a, have an untreated control where there was no cover crop. It was a bare fallow um, in the winter and no fertility amendments were added. And this is what the mother trial looks like. This was in uh, year two and three where the two year rotation plots were all in strawberries, which you can see in the beds with the plastic. Now, there are always issues with doing um, replicated trials where you have relatively small size plots and so we wanted to also see how well the, the treatments worked on a farm scale. So in addition to this mother trial we set up um, six baby trials and these trials are of a subset of the treatments which the farmers chose um, and they chose as a group to look at the what they think is the best rotation um, which is the broccoli-based four-year rotation. Um, so this is identical to uh, some of the treatments in the mother trial. And within each of the baby trials, um, we had the same four fertility and disease management treatments, plus we added um, a treatment of the growers' standard practices, how they would normally grow that particular crop. And this is a, a picture that shows you the six baby trials. Um, and if you look at the map, you can see that they stretch um, quite a, a distance around the Central Coast area um, from 
uh, up north of Santa Cruz down to, into the Salinas Valley. So what did we find? I'm going to start off first talking about um, the productivity of the vegetable crops. And in year one, if you look at the upper figure, uh, there was no treatment effects. Um, whether we had a cover crop or not, or whether we had the bare fallow, and whether we added compost um, and supplemental fertility to the broccoli didn't make any difference. And that's not surprising since this field uh, has been in long-term organic management uh, and it's very fertile. So um, I would expect that there'd be enough um, residual fertility in the soil uh, to support a broccoli crop the first year. However, by the third year, we started to see treatment differences emerging. And that's the lower graph, um, where you can see that the uh, in both the four-year rotation and the two-year rotation, the cover crop with the compost and supplemental fertility did give the highest broccoli yields. But there was no significant difference between the rest of the treatments. So um, give the, this effect of um, increased productivity by adding compost and feather meal uh, was consistent with earlier studies where we looked at the fertility management in organic broccoli. And what we learned from that st um, study was that um, the, a pre side dress nitrate test um, seemed to be a good way of predicting whether you needed to add any additional fertilizer beyond what you had, um, at, you know, what you'd, you'd done pre-plant. And we decided to use that as a guide in this uh, study, in the mother and baby trials. And so in the cover crop and compost system, we only added feather meal in those plots where the pre side dress nitrate test um, registered below 25 parts per million nitrate. And that's a zero to 12 inch sample. Uh, lettuce yields across all three years uh, didn't show any treatment effects. Um, again, given the, that this is a very um, fertile site and lettuce is a short season crop, that's not entirely unexpected at this point. Um, and our best yields, the cover crop with the compost and fer fertilizer of uh, feather meal, um, compared very well against grower standard practices in the baby trial. And I'll just show you the average of broccoli head yields in 2014, that was year three of the trial, um, across the baby trials. And you can see that uh, is a nice progression from the bare fallow having the lowest yields, the cover crop, the next highest, and the cover crop of mustard cake about the same, and then the cover crop, compost and fertilizer, and the grower standards had the highest yields. So um, we wanted to look at uh, the data from the mother and baby trials to see if using the pre side dress nitrate test was actually useful or not. And so what I'm showing in this table is for each of the five baby trials. The first column shows the yield uh, of the, the treatment with the pre side, side dress nitrate test. Uh, divided by the grower standard. So if they had equivalent yields, that would be 100%. If it's more than 100, that means that the PSNT treatment did better. And if we look, we'll see, um, we'll, the next column shows the actual uh, fertility inputs that the grower used. Doesn't include compost. Um, and then the, the supplemental N addition that we've recommended based on the PSNT is given in the next column. And then the comparison of whether we use more or less nitrogen inputs uh, is in the final column. And if you look at the numbers in um, purple, you can see that in a number of cases, we actually um, had a negative saving. That is, we added more uh, fertility, nitrogen fertility inputs in the PSNT system than the grower had done in their treatment. But in each case, if you go back to the relative yields, that additional nitrogen 
input led to an increase of uh, over 30 percent in yields. Um, so what that says is that the farmer was under applying um, the nitrogen to get optimal broccoli yields, but then the grower can decide whether 30 percent additional yield, especially if the mar um, given the market with broccoli, whether it's worth the cost of the feather meal addition or not. In the one case where um, we did get a savings was when um, the grower standard was much higher than what was recommended from PSNT, and that's the figures in red. Um, and interestingly, even there, with adding less um, PSNT, we still got a 36% um, yield increase relative to the grower standard. Um, and in the case when they were very similar, uh, the grower applied a, about what we recommended, um, we got equivalent yields. So I think overall it's saying that this test can be a very useful way of deciding if you're likely to get a yield increase by adding any supplemental feather meal, um, and then the farmer can judge if it's worth the cost to do that. So what we found in this system also is that um, soil nitrate levels are highly dynamic. Um, and this is contrary to the idea of organic systems having a steady slow release of inorganic nitrogen. And I'm just going to show you some data from the mother trial and then from one of the baby trials. So I know this is a complicated looking graph, um, but I just want to highlight some general trends. You can see that there are a lot of peaks and valleys. And this graph goes from September 2011 uh, to December 2014. And what happens if we start um, at the beginning is that in the first few months, uh, what residual nitrate was in the soil pretty much disappeared um, uh, when growing a winter cover crop. And then the peak that you see here um, in all treatments comes from when the cover crop is incorporated um, and the ground is tilled and the broccoli transplanted. So what it says is that we got rapid mineralization of the nitrogen in the cover crops and that the decline from the peak uh, is where as the broccoli takes up that nitrate and ammonium that's available. I hear I'm just showing nitrate, but ammonia shows much smaller peaks. So then um, after the broccoli is harvested, however, we rec return a lot of the broccoli residue back into the soil. And so what happens again is that gets mineralized in the early fall. Um, and we, you can see we get peaks as high or higher than we did with the cover crop incorporation. And so what this tells us is that uh, this late season um, peak of nitrate is very vulnerable to leaching by winter rains. And you can see it declined um, to virtually zero by the next sampling. Um, these were uh, samplings done every month, I believe. Um, and some of that may well have been leached. Uh, the cover crop was planted uh, in November. Um, but was very small during um, you know, the first couple of months and so would not have been able to take up a lot of that nitrate. So this is something I want to come back to in terms of how to um, deal with this rapid release of nitrate from these high nitrogen red crop residues. And then as we go through, we see the peak again from cover crop um, decomposition, from the decomposition of the lettuce, etc. And just to show that it's not unique to the mother trial, here's data from one of the baby trials, um, where again you see the same peak after cover crops incorporated, and then again after the broccoli is incorporated. So um, clearly there are um, issues with uh, where we do have periods of time with high levels of nitrate um, occurring in the soil. Um, and just to mention that uh, it's mostly 
the cover crop with the mustard cake and uh, the in most of the treatments and the cover crop with the compost and feather meal treatment that tend to have the highest peaks but um, it's somewhat variable. So we're in the process of calculating nitrogen budgets for each of the systems um, and for the mother and baby trials and estimating losses. We tried to use lysimeters to measure leaching losses, um, but we actually had very little deep drainage, um, in part because of the drought we've been experiencing in California. Um, and we do have some uh, greenhouse gas emission data, and we're putting all that together with the DNDC model, uh, that's a denitrification decomposition model, to try and estimate what the losses are and when they're occurring. And we're doing multi-year analysis of the factors that are influencing yield and uh, nitrogen dynamics. So what are the take-home messages for fertility? Um, can you use pre-site dress nitrate tests to decide whether supplemental uh, fertility addition would lead to higher yields? Uh, we have this rapid mineralization of high nitrogen crop residues. And particularly the one in the late summer um, is a concern prior to winter rains. And so to manage that, we need to get the winter cover crop in as early as possible. Or we're looking into the option of adding low carbon, uh, sorry, low nitrogen, uh, high carbon materials in the fall um, to immobilize that nitrogen. Um, but we don't have any data on that as yet. There's also some potential for nitrogen loss in the spring after cover crop incorporation um, and while the, uh, before the cash crop is planted and while it's small. And we do know that denitrification can be quite high uh, when establishing transplants or irrigating um, to maintain seedling growth. And so that's another area of loss that we're trying to, to look at how that could be managed. Now, if you use ASD um, as a disease management strategy, um, you're adding a significant amount of carbon. Um, our typical treatment with ASD has been six to nine tons per acre of rice bran, which is about two, a little over 2% nitrogen. And so you're adding a lot of nitrogen uh, just through the ASD treatment. So we need to adjust fertility to allow for that. And we found that usually you don't need any pre-plant uh, fertility applications for strawberries if you're using rice bran as, a, as the carbon source for ASD. Uh, but for some other carbon sources that have less available nitrogen, um, that's not the case. So in terms of strawberries, uh, in the first strawberry crops we had were in the two-year rotation. And I should mention that this particular field was chosen in part because it has a high level of verticillium uh, in the soil. Uh, this was despite it being a long-term organic site with uh, usually six to seven year rotations. Uh, but that's a reflection of the fact that most of the rotation crops are hosts for verticillium. What we found in, in uh, the second year rotation, uh, the two-year rotation, was that yields high, were highly correlated to how severe the verticillium was. And that we had um, some disease even in the ASD plots, but they were responsible for the highest yields. Uh, the mustard seed meal, in contrast, uh, didn't show any benefit in terms of verticillium control. Now in year four, the whole, um, all treatments were in strawberries. So this allowed us to look more closely at strawberry yields and disease. And if you look at the first graph, um, which is the yield uh, in pounds per acre of strawberries, and there are two columns, uh, one with broccoli and one for lettuce. And what this shows is if averaged across um, all the treatments, all the rotations, um, if broccoli was, um, and all the ASD, mustard cake, etc. if you average across those, rotations that had broccoli before strawberries led to significantly higher strawberry yields than those that had lettuce prior to strawberries, which, re which reinforces um, 
some earlier work that suggested that broccoli um, can either suppress um, verticillium or at least is a non-host and will perform better than known hosts like lettuce. And that holds up if you look at the second of the upper graphs, which shows the WILT score, um, which is a measure of how severe WILT symptoms were on the plants. Again, you saw lower incidence of WILT in the broccoli rotations versus the lettuce rotations. In terms of uh, the effect of ASD, um, we actually saw a significant benefit from ASD in the two-year rotation plots, but not in the four-year rotation plots, which is the lower graph, um, which is interesting in that um, there's no difference in the, in the yields between the two- and four-year rotations with ASD. Um, I should mention that the ASD treatment did not work as well as we had hoped. We were not able to get um, very good anaerobic conditions for a variety of um, reasons mostly related to difficulties of management. Um, so we are, um, I, I guess, encouraged that we saw some positive effect of ASD um, in, uh, in terms of yields in the two-year rotation. Um, but not even uh, not in the fourth, but in the four-year rotation, you can see yields were much higher than they were in the two-year rotation anyway. Now, what's interesting is we've um, since done some analysis of soil microbial communities uh, and um, looking at the measure, the amount of verticillium in the soil. And what is interesting is that in the ASD-treated soils that also had broccoli as the prior crop, we saw a significant reduction in the amount of verticillium in the soil. So the combination of broccoli and ASD um, based on the soil data, which I don't have uh, it all to show you, unfortunately, um, suggests that we are knocking back the verticillium uh, inoculum in the soil. Now, in the baby trials, we saw no treatment differences, um, and this was in part because of a large variation in how good the sites were for strawberries. Um, and so the trends are similar to what uh, we saw, but um, again, the differences are not statistically significant. So I want to draw on some other work that we've done to talk more about um, the effect of ASD and verticillium. And this was another rotation study we did on the farm, in fact, in a field adjacent to the mother trial. And here we had different pretreatments before planting strawberries. We either had a bare fallow, a cauliflower crop, or a broccoli crop. And then we did um, an untreated control, mustard seed meal, uh, which is the MC in this figure, uh, which stands for mustard cake, another name for it, uh, ASD with rice bran, and ASD with rice bran plus mustard cake as the carbon source. And you can see in there was no significant effect of whether we had fallow, cauliflower, or broccoli, but um, the ASD treatments did lead to significantly lower um, Infest, uh, infection rates, and that's the number uh, that we're showing uh, on the vertical axis in, in a percentage. So you can see in some of the untreated um, plots, we had between 65 and 90 percent um, infection rate, whereas in the ASD, it was down around the 20, 25 percent range. And again, mustard cake seems to have some effect um, but it's not um, clear-cut. But what was interesting is after we had grown strawberries in that rotation, we then grew a winter cover crop and planted lettuce um, the following year. And then at the end of the lettuce crop, we analyzed the soil for the number of microsclerotia of um, verticillium per gram of soil. And so this we, it was taking soil samples almost two years from when the ASD was applied. And what was uh, striking was that um, we had a significant reduction in the number of microsclerotia uh, found after the lettuce crop in the two ASD treatments. 
And just for um, reference, you need about one to two microsclerotia per gram of soil to get significant disease. So, um, you know, the numbers are fairly low, but relative to the uh, untreated control, which registered at 2.8 microsclerotia, um, the AST with rice bran reduced it that down to 0.3. So this suggests that any benefit of ASD continued uh, for at least another year um, after the strawberry crop. And so this is something we want to look at in the mother trial um, as we go through a second rotation cycle to see if we, we see a cumulative effect of um, the ASD over time. But what if you have other diseases than verticillium? Well, we did some work on a site that's very heavily infested with fusarium wilt. And uh, there are a few things we've learned uh, that are a guide if you happen to have uh, fusarium uh, oxysporum in your uh, field. The first thing is that the cultivar of strawberries that you plant can make a big difference. There is quite a wide range of um, sensitivity to and tolerance to fusarium amongst commercially available cultivars. And here you can see pictures for um, San Andreas and Albion. And Albion, uh, which is the one we've used in most of our experiments, is actually very sensitive and uh, susceptible to fusarium. And then you can see by contrast the San Andreas, um, there was very little uh, yield reduction due to the fusarium. The other thing is mustard seed meal on its own, uh, applied at three tons per acre was very ineffective. Um, you got a lot of disease by the end of the, by the middle of the season actually. Um, the ASD planted in the fall, uh, uh, sorry, the ASD um, applied during the fall immediately prior to strawberry planting, which is the typical time we do it, also didn't control fusarium. You can see a lot of the dead plants in, in that plot as well. Whereas if we did ASD in the summer instead, um, with the same nine tons per acre of rice bran as the carbon source, we got much better control. In fact, we got very good control. And this relates to the fact that the you need higher soil temperatures um, with ASD to control fusarium. Another um, disease I mentioned is charcoal rot, and that's caused by an organism, Macrophina, Macrophomina uh, fasciolina. And we have a field that we were doing demonstrations of ASD on um, in Southern California, um, where um, we found that macrophamina was present in the soil. And so these are some pictures of the field. Um, the one in the, the top with the bare field, uh, the bare plastic just shows you um, what the field looks like while ASD is happening. And then when you've uh, allowed the ASD process to happen for three weeks, you come in and punch holes in the plastic and transplant through those holes. Um, and then the rest of the pictures are from February, um, which is early season, um, but already in production in this area. And you can see there's a huge difference in the growth of the grower standard um, and both of the ASD treatments. With the ASD with rice bran, nine tons per acre, um, having the biggest plants. Uh, and we've often found an early season growth stimulation with ASD. Later in the season, uh, the disease suppression comes in as being more important. And this shows um, the differences between treatments in the same field. Um, the grower standard had very significant levels of disease. Um, and the ASPD with the rice bran at nine tons seemed to be doing much better than the ASD with mustard seed meal at two tons and rice bran at three tons as the carbon source. So what does that translate to in terms of yields? Well, uh, we did this trial two years in a row, and you can see that the by far the highest yield came with the ASD with the rice bran at nine tons, um, which reflects 
lower disease, the, um, which I'll show you in a moment, um, and that we had actually almost doubled, well, more than doubled the yield relative to the standard practices that the grower was using. If we look at plant mortality, um, what's interesting is that we didn't completely control the disease again, um, but we significantly reduced it relative to the other treatments in the rice bran with nine tons per acre. So we still had 17% mortality in uh, the 2014 season. Uh, and in the 2015 season, we had 9% mortality. And I should mention that we had to harvest early, uh, ended earlier in um, 2015 for a variety of reasons related to market and, and labor shortages. So the numbers aren't exactly comparable because they were done a month earlier than the 2014 data. So basically when we come to thinking about managing ASD, um, it's important that both obviously the carbon source the type and the rate makes a difference in terms of whether you get good pathogen control. Temperature um, can be very important, particularly for fusarium and maybe for macrofamina as well. And the amount of water that's added needs to be sufficient to get good anaerobic conditions. Um, and one question we're looking at now is whether um, the cultivar that we use um, makes a difference in terms of how well ASD works. So the take home messages from the ASD are ASD can control verdiance verticillium wilt when it's applied in the fall prior to planting strawberries. And we have probably more than a dozen field trials that have shown 80 to 100% control of verticillium wilt. Um, we observed this long-term suppression in soils uh, over 18 months after the treatment had been applied. So there may be long-term suppression benefits from using ASD. In terms of fusarium, need to do ASD uh, when the soil temperatures are much higher than in the fall. So uh, if you want to control ASD, uh, fusarium with ASD, you need to do it um, in this area in the summer. Varietal resistance is a really important component with uh, managing fusarium. And we're also looking at some different carbon sources, um, particularly grass residues are, have been shown from some greenhouse trials to produce volatiles that are more toxic to fusarium than rice bran does during ASD. So uh, we have experiments underway to see if that's another option. In terms of macrofamina, we got partial control uh, with rice bran, nine tons per acre ASD, but not complete control. So again, we're looking at other carbon sources to see if any work better. And there's also some evidence that rotating with specific wheat varieties before strawberries may help to control macrofamina. Um, and experiments testing that are underway at the moment. In terms of mustard seed meal, um, it doesn't control verticillium. Um, it may control, uh, help control some other diseases um, based on some other work that's happening. And one thing we have found out is that the particular source of mustard seed meal you use and whether it's in a powdered form versus a pelleted material can result in very different levels of disease suppression. And so that's something that, again, we're looking at in more detail. Um, the other thing to note is that the nitrogen is rapidly uh, mineralized from the mustard seed meal and released within a couple of weeks after application in the fall, um, making it vulnerable to being lost by leaching. So in terms of soil carbon, and I'm almost done, this is the last data. Um, after three years, which is the most recent data we have, we were surprised to see that we're already seeing measurable effects on total soil carbon due to cover crop addition. And that's what this graph shows you, the um, three treatments with cover crops versus the bare fallow. Uh, and the bare fallow is losing carbon relative to um, the treatments that have the cover crop additions. The other thing we found is that 
growing strawberries in the rotation also leads to a decline in soil organic matter or soil carbon. Um, and this was a little bit of a surprise that we saw this significant difference after just one um, the strawberry uh, cultivation in the three-year period. So basically, we know that cover crops are critical for retaining soil carbon. At the moment, we're not seeing any additional benefit of the compost, um, but that may change over time. And that growing strawberries um, can reduce soil carbon, and we think that's because, on the one hand, it's replacing a winter cover crop, uh, and so you're getting less carbon inputs into the soil in that, rota in that, at that phase of the rotation. But also having the beds covered with plastic for many months uh, increases soil temperatures and could probably stimulate decomposition of existing soil organic matter. And we're hoping to be able to continue the rotation for another cycle and we'll see if these changes in soil carbon are maintained over time. We're still working on the economic analysis and, as I mentioned, the um, modeling nitrogen dyna uh, dynamics and greenhouse gas emissions. And we're also doing a complete life cycle analysis for the rotations that we've tested. But that data won't be available for a few months. So in conclusion, um, obviously we need to complete a second rotation cycle to see how robust the results are. Um, one rotation cycle isn't, it isn't sufficient. But what we do know, or at least the data suggests, that the four-year rotation is better than the two-year rotation for controlling verticillium, unless you use ASD, in which case um, that can uh, improve the strawberry production in the two-year system. There is a disease control benefit from growing broccoli prior to strawberries relative to growing lettuce. Um, but the, the fact that ASD can control the verticillium to, to a large degree may give growers more flexibility in, in the crops that they can choose to rotate between uh, strawberry crops, especially if the data to, uh, sustains the idea that um, use of ASD creates more suppressive soils. Uh, the PSNT is a good tool for managing nitrogen fertility. Soil nitrate is highly dynamic, uh, as we're, we pointed out, and there are potential periods where losses could be high. And the effect of strawberry uh, on soil carbon uh, means that we need to pay attention to uh, rebuilding soil carbon after planting strawberries. So uh, finally, just to mention that um, we have been surveying farmers to both before this project and are now doing it after the project uh, to, to assess changes in farmer knowledge level about um, ASD and mustard seed meal and uh, this organic project. Um, and in a recent field tour, we had very positive response from growers. Um, and the use of ASD has grown significantly from 2011 when we started, uh, where it was at two uh, acres in the region to over 800 acres, and which represents about 20% of the organic strawberry acreage is already, uh, or is testing or using ASD at this point. So it's where you can get more resources um, to get more information on this, the main place to go will be our project website, um, and the address is given up there. It's calcornetwork.sites.ucsc. And then there are a number of other webinars and publications that we've done, and I'll just list them up here um, so that you can see. But most of them will be available on the project website, or there'll be links to them on the project website. And then uh, in the coming months, we're going to be producing additional videos on uh, things like anaerobic soil disinfestation, and also publishing a, a guide to what we've learned about how to manage rotations, and a guide specifically for ASD management for strawberries. So with that, I apologize for going over time um, by a few minutes, but now I'm happy to take questions and invite Joji to jump in and answer any of the questions you may have. 
Thank you, Carol. Um, in case you just joined us, I wanted to welcome you to type in questions for Carol and for Joji, who's going to be joining us as well, um, into the question box, which we'll be reading out loud for the next 30 minutes or so. And if you have general questions about organic farming, um, you're always also welcome to use the e-extension Ask an Expert service, and you'll get an answer. So moving on to the questions, um, we've gotten several. Um, first question, is there a possibility of reducing or completely doing away with ground prep or turning to cut down on the spikes of nutrients and leaching potential. Would you like to take that one, Joji? Uh, so the question is about uh, how to remove the nitrate peak after residue incorporation. Yeah, whether if you we reduce the amount of tillage, I think if that's oh. a possible way of doing it. Yeah. Um, our farm, farm manager at UCSC Farm tried um, like an undercut broccoli residue instead of incorporation um, and expecting to reduce the nitrate peak and rather than incorporation uh, providing rapid decomposition and then uh, by un just undercut and laying, laying it on top of the so soil surface it may decompose gradually, hence the uh, reduce the peak of nitrate. And um, yeah, but unfortunately, we haven't taken any data for that. So it's a possibility, but uh, I don't have any data. And then you would plant a cover crop, presumably through the broccoli residue that's on yes. the surface. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. decompose to some degree. So yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. <clears throat> Okay, um, we're getting a couple of other a couple of questions about whether any other um, brassica um, crops were um, looked at in rotation with strawberries, for example, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, or Asian greens. Um, yes, in in the other rotation trial I briefly mentioned, we did try cauliflower, um, and cauliflower is. It's a host of verticillium, but not, it seems, the strain that is most um, aggressive against strawberries. So uh, it doesn't seem to, there's no evidence, I think, that it suppresses verticillium, um, but uh, it should not lead to an increase in verticillium. Um, other than that, I don't think cabbage has, has been looked at, but I'd have to check. The, there was a rotation study done a number of years ago. Joji, do you remember who the first author was? Yeah, Krishna Subarao. Um, yeah. He's the one who's been doing a lot of broccoli residue rotation work. And I think they compared broccoli and uh, either cabbage or Brussels sprouts. I think it was cabbage. Brussels, br yeah, actually, and Brussels sprouts, I think. Yeah, and then, the, yeah, uh, clearly, their data clearly shows that broccoli is the most effective one uh, over other brassicaceae plants. Uh, crops. Okay. Um, do you have any recommended um, places to get rice bran? Um, would a feed mill be a good place, or is that something that is just widely available in coastal California? Well, it's interesting. When we started the project, rice bran um, was seen as a waste product that the California rice industry was trying to get rid of, but now it's become popular. Um, also as an animal feed, so it's actually getting more difficult and more expensive to get rice bran. Um, depending where you are in the country, um, I don't know, if you're in California, then the company Farm Fuel Incorporated um, manages the supply of, of rice bran uh, at the moment, um, and you can contact them elsewhere, I'm not sure. Joji? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know other places, but uh, yeah, the, the rice production area in Louisiana and, and other places uh, sh should have plenty of rice bran. Also, uh, it doesn't have to be rice bran. You know, wheat bran is supposed to be much more available in this country, and uh, it it's, it is as effective as rice bran. Um, it's well it's a well known um, fact. That and then in Japan, that where this method was originally developed, uh, wheat bran is much more popular than rice bran. Okay, good to know. 
Um, speaking of wheat, um, what wheat varieties or other um, cereals have been tested? Um, for that, I would put you in contact with Dr. Mark Mazzola, who's at USDA um, ARS uh, tree fruit lab in Wenatchee, Washington. He's done this work, um, and I don't remember off the top of my head which of the varieties that are effective at suppressing macrophamina and which ones aren't. Um, but I do know it's very variety specific. Um, and one of the things we're trying to look at is, can we find wheat that grows well in coastal California um, and that also suppresses the disease? Do you remember, Joji? Um, let's see, I'm checking here right now. Um, there are two varieties that uh, reduce the uh, macrophomina, Fisirina. It's called Summit and Carrojo. Those are two varieties that Mark found that suppress macrophomina, but he doesn't know why, so <laughs> he's very... <laughs> <laughs> it's very early days of yeah, trying early. to work out that relationship. Okay. Um, are there any other promising cover crops for strawberry disease suppression, for example, oats, buckwheat, or Sudan grass? We're looking at um, cover crops, uh, and the Sudan grass we're looking at as a growing it as a short um, for a short period of time in the late summer um, prior to fall ASD. So you could grow one vegetable crop a short crop like lettuce or something else that would be harvested and then plant the um, Sudan grass probably in August. Um, and we're looking at how effective that is on its own, but also looking at it uh, in combination with ASD. And one of the things that might work is that if we can chop up the residue, um, that could be part of the carbon source for ASD, so you could actually reduce the amount of rice bran, for example, that you would put in the soil, which would be good from a nitrogen management perspective. Um, so we're trying to see both if the cover crops, I mean, there's not a lot of evidence that any of the cover crops really suppress the disease, um, I, to my knowledge, um, but whether in combination with using them with ASD could be uh, lower cost and better in terms of nitrogen dynamics uh, could be a better option. So we have trials underway to, to look at that. Okay, um, someone just pointed out that the web link at the top of the page there needs to have a .edu at the end. Um, oh, so sorry. in case, okay, yeah, thank you very much um, yes, for that. Um, yeah, so if you're having trouble linking to that, um, if you copied down the address, um, do add a .edu at the end. So thanks very much for that comment. It's very easy to omit these things, um, but yeah, we really do appreciate that. Um, and um, can you also share Mark's contact or name again, or maybe spell his last name or so, just because it's Mark Mazzola. Um, and his last name is spelt M A Z Z O L A. Okay, I'll just type that in here for everybody in case they missed it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right. Um, oh, yeah, a couple of people um, are asking about rice bran, um, since some has known to have chemical residues as well as wheat bran. So, um, don't the sources of rice and wheat bran need to be from certified organic production in order to use it for organic production? That hasn't been required so far. Okay. Um, you might want to check with your certifier since that's always... Yeah. Um, when we originally got this approved uh, through CCOF, um, that wasn't a requirement. Okay. I don't know if there's any organic rice bran available. Do you, Joji? It's available, but very limited amount. And um, and the question may be some related to uh, the incident that found very high, like uh, heavy metals or something, contam contaminants in rice bran. But uh, I haven't never seen that uh, actual data um, from the rice bran we've been using. So, of course, the, each one should check their certifier about the use of uh, conventional rice bran, but um, the chemical contaminants issue, uh, I, I don't think that's a 
big concern. Okay, if anybody would like to type in more questions, um, we still have a little time, so um, definitely don't be shy, um, and chances are you might get your question answered. Um, we did get one about whether these principles can um, be applied to home gardeners. Yes, I think they can. Um, and actually, I have bad verticillium wilt in my garden, so I'm thinking of doing ASD there. <laughs> um, so I think the same principles would apply. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, um, oh, here we go. Um, somebody wanted to get a copy of the presentation. And actually, these slides right now are in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. So um, you should be able to find them right there. Um, in that control panel, there's a little section that says handouts, and you should be able to um, have it right there. So I'll just give another minute or so um, in case you need to find that. Anyone else have any more questions? Um, just want to remind everyone that you can find the past webinar that this group gave on ASD as well as several other webinars um, in the webinar archive on your screen. And a recording of this one will be available in about a week or so. And um, it looks like that's it for the questions. So um, I'd like to thank you very much, Carol and Joji, for um, sharing your research with us today. And we look forward to future webinars um, to hear more about the economic analysis or anything else that you've learned. So thank you to everyone for joining us.